Welcome to the second episode of Pope Snowflake and a multi-segment profile of Pius IX that covers a great deal of content given that he snuck out of Rome in 1848 over civic discontent with clerical rule, lost the papal states altogether in the 1860s, and in 1870 declared himself infallible, and then started referring to himself, self-pityingly, as the prisoner of the Vatican. Professor David Kurtzer provides an in-depth background on the 1848 uprising and ensuing papal exile in his book, The Pope Who Would Be King. Kurtzer is notable for his exquisitely detailed history of events that draw from Vatican archives, diplomatic correspondence, and news reports. At the end of the first video on Gregory XVI, it noted that he was the most hated pope for two centuries, and his dogmatic and reactionary attitude only served to increase the anti-clerical sentiments in the Papal States. Unfortunately, pickings for a new pope were slim among the cardinals, a group which Kurtzer writes were known neither for their intelligence nor for their understanding of the changing world. What the Papal States got was another compromise candidate, Pius IX, a pastoral cardinal with no experience in either Vatican diplomacy or understanding of the political nature of church bureaucracy. This was a man whose abilities were entirely outmatched by the radical changes facing an archaic institution and its continued survival. Initially welcomed by the people and seen as a refreshing change from Gregory, the interlude would not last. Pius started off making overtures in the right direction. A month after being elected, he issued a blanket amnesty for all the political dissidents who had been arrested for advocating change within the Papal States. As the saying goes, give people an inch and they will take a mile. By Pius opening the door with the amnesty, the people's demands for reforms increased, just as the cardinals had warned their new pontiff would happen. Calls were growing for the despised clerics to be removed from positions of authority, for talented commoners to take over administration of the government, and for freedom of the press. As for secularizing the government, the Pope reminded his citizens that the Papal States were instituted by the will of God, so their demands amounted to a call for defying the divine mandate, something which a deeply devoted Pope was not about to condone. By November 1846, Pius released his first encyclical, which bore all the hallmarks of Gregory's own reactionary resistance to modernism. Once again, the Vatican had painted itself into a corner through its own self-serving rhetoric over the centuries, that the Pope was unable to have a detached and rational perspective that would enable him to formulate a reasonable solution, viewing any human progress as an impudent challenge. As he, and the rest of the Cardinals, were not able to come up with a fair and democratic solution of allowing laymen to run the government, one would be forced upon them. The following is a highly condensed summary of events that are more fully detailed in this section of my book, Sins of the Fathers. In April 1847, under pressure from his own people and the European governments to stabilize the situation by granting more reforms, Pius created the Consultative Council, consisting of three prominent men to be nominated by the local prelate from each province within the Papal States. Then, in January 1848, facing widespread protests, Ferdinand of the Kingdom of Naples was pressured into granting a constitution to calm the unrest. Over the next few weeks, both Tuscan and Sardinian nobles also announced constitutions for the people in their realms. Consequently, the pressure on the Vatican to follow suit in the Papal States intensified. By mid-March 1848, Pius announced a constitution for the Papal States, one drafted entirely by the clergy and designed to protect the privileges of the Church in a hybrid constitutional theocracy. The constitution allowed for the creation of an elected lower chamber, an upper chamber of papal appointees, and acting as a papal senate, would be the College of Cardinals. However, since the cardinals were bound to obey the pope in all matters, there was effectively no change to the absolutist nature of the government. The people wanted more freedoms, and by granting some concessions, the pope had unleashed forces he could no longer contain. Following the assassination of a civilian politician distrusted by both sides, one of the political clubs wrote a manifesto claiming it was taking responsibility upon itself for maintaining order, and on November 16th, with a crowd of nationalist supporters, the manifesto was taken to the Pope. Pius read the demands contained in the manifesto and issued his response. The crowd was to disperse as the Pope, the Vicar of Christ on Earth, would not submit under threat to the people. Yet again, Pius failed to read the mood of the people, trusting in his position to overawe the faithful Italian Catholics who should tremble and obey his every command. 
His arrogant dismissal backfired catastrophically. The infuriated crowd set fire to one of the gates of the Pope's residence, the Quirinal Palace, and armed protesters climbed the nearby bell tower and started firing through the windows, killing a man standing in proximity to the Pope. The protesters swelled to 10,000, blocking streets, loading carts with flammable materials, and a cannon was wheeled in and aimed at the main gate. The crowd demanded the Pope appoint new ministers of their choosing, declare Italian independence, and join the King of Sardinia in expelling the Austrians. By evening, the Pope had agreed to appoint new ministers. Meanwhile, civic guardsmen had subdued the Swiss Guard and confined them to quarters. A week later, on November 24th, and dressed as a humble priest, Pius snuck out a back gate of the residence and made his way south overnight to a fishing town in the kingdom of Naples, where Pius sought the protection of King Ferdinand. Totally oblivious to the reality of the situation in which he now found himself, and blissfully unaware that the emperor had no clothes, Kurtzer notes that within two days of his flight, Pius wrote out several draft responses addressing what had happened, each more uncompromising. From the Pope's dogmatic perspective, surely God would intervene and set things right. Once again, an embittered and reactionary Pope made things worse. Using his 1849 New Year's address, he lashed out at the violent protesters who had unseated him, demonstrating his complete obtuseness given the irony of centuries of clerical corruption and mismanagement, stating, This same bunch of lunatics who still today tyrannize Rome and the Papal States with their barbarous despotism. He called the decision to create a national assembly detestable and made a veiled threat of excommunication for any Italian who supported its creation. The reaction of the people to the Pope's address was telling. Protesters looted the store which supplied the cardinal hats and papal skullcap, paraded them through the streets, and threw them into the Tiber. The New Year's address was torn from the doors of the churches and thrown into latrines, and the papal coat of arms was ripped off government buildings and tossed into the river along with the hats. In the months following the Pope's flight, a series of diplomatic negotiations ensued between the Pope and legations from the various interested European powers. Given the stubborn refusal of Pius to cede any ground, given his unquestioned divine right to rule, no progress was made. The Catholic monarchies of Austria, Spain, and Naples had sided with the Pope, but France, the fledgling secular republic which had no sympathy for the Pope's temporal claims, was not going to sit back and allow Austria to control Rome, reinstate the Pope, and return things to the old ways. On April 16th, the French Assembly voted to send an expeditionary force of 12,000 men to the Papal States, nominally to safeguard the rights of the people. The role of the French will be a subject of its own future video, but is tangential to Pius's temper tantrums in this segment. The French legation, desperate to limit the damage from supporting a retrograde theocratic state, lobbied the Pope to try and get him to the middle ground on preserving some of the democratic reforms. Pius dug in his heels, stating, So don't imagine that the return to the old order of things is possible. I would never permit it. By June, the Pope still refused to cede any ground on keeping the constitutional reforms, so the French decided to change tactics. Harcourt, the French ambassador to the Vatican, recommended France should seize Rome and, quoting him, stated, Impose very clear conditions on Pius, because if one does not impose them, they won't do anything. Pius continued to stubbornly reject any idea of reform, given that a constitutional democracy and an autocratic theocracy were not suited to coexist together. Freedoms had only led to evil, and Pius now recognized that his earlier concessions to modernizing demands were incompatible with long-held church teachings, and he would not compound his mistake by allowing the reforms to continue. The French, widely seen as betraying their secular principles to prop up an archaic and hated theocracy, were caught in a political quagmire. However, they were still lobbying hard behind the scenes with the Pope to get him to agree to some reforms. In the meantime, the Pope appointed three cardinals, two reactionaries, and one who was more open-minded, to oversee the government during his continued exile in Naples, and which was announced on August 1st. The Cardinal's Commission wasted no time, as by the next day they had annulled previous democratic measures instituted by the Republicans. Worse, the Commission reinstated ecclesiastical tribunals, the priestly courts that intruded into people's private lives, and was detested by the Romans. They would also go on to cancel freedom of the press and reintroduce censorship, the Roman people had viewed the French army as a puppet of the Vatican, 
but quickly came to understand that the French were all that protected them from the vengeance of the cardinals. On April 12, 1850, with the French having failed to win any liberal concessions from the Pope, Pius finally returned to Rome, albeit with French troops still maintaining order. Despite centuries of papal rhetoric that church authority was greater than any secular government, it was rather ironic that only the armies of the Austrians in the first half of the 19th century and the French during the Republican crises kept the papacy in power. If you like my content, please like and subscribe to get notified of new videos. Please also consider supporting my work by becoming a Patreon sponsor. You can also find me on the following platforms.